Welcome to the V2V podcast, another episode of the Survivor Series, and we are continuing our talk about Sunset Bay Academy. We did the um, investigation on kind of who they are and what they do and their backgrounds, and we have since gathered more information about what it's like to actually be there as a teen. And before we get into that, uh, hello, Alexi. Hey there, Marcus. Hey. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to um, let everybody know about Sunset Bay Academy. Yep. Yep. So one of the things we found out Actually, talking with um, Eric Thor, he was a teacher there for a while. He tried to organize the students to kind of fight back, but was unsuccessful. He got fired. Um, he uh, he came on and did an interview with you. Um, yeah. And I got back in touch with him recently, and we, we decided to do a little bit more research on Sunset Bay Academy because I think as I mentioned in in the last investigation that they run their their business out of a post office box in San Isidro, California, which is just south of San Diego, just north of, of the border. It's actually on it's a border town. But right. They have an address. It's um, 641 East Cedar Boulevard, Suite B3. And if you look that up and you discover that Suite B3 is a post office box and the address is made to look like it's an actual office. Right. It's not. They run another school, I guess, and another name out of the same address called the California Leadership Academy, which is actually located in the same building that Sunset Bay is in. They just are using two organizations in one location, I think doing exactly the same thing. I think it's just a matter of uh, what you click on first. You, you're either go to Sunset Bay or you go to California Leadership Academy, but they're the same thing, the same place, same staff, same everything. So, two different names. so it's more like Google swamping and it's just a way to like pick up more and catch more fish, I guess. Yeah. And what was interesting about California Leadership Academy is it's pretty under the radar. There's not a whole lot of information about it except, um, from the standard, you know, brochures and uh, internet information that they provide. They're like zero reviews. People don't even know it mm. exists. And, and it's not, unless you, unless you um, look for it, you're not going to know that it's the same thing as Sunset Bank. Right. Because they've had a lot of controversy, rightly so. So this is a tactic to um, avoid all that, you know, to create a whole new entity that's really the same thing with a different name. Yeah. The other really amazing thing we found out is that, um, so it it appears that the Sunset Bay Academy in 2009 had um, – an issue with the California Secretary of State involving uh, taxes, and that LLC was suspended way back in 2009. So they surprise, don't really surprise. Yeah, they're not really operating under the, in a like a corporate sense. And I'm like, how? I was thinking to myself, how is that even possible? So our uh, our Mexican friend Eric. He uh, he looked 
uh, Mexican corporations and discovered that Sunset Bay Academy is incorporated actually in Mexico. It's a Mexican company, um, which is entirely different. The rules are totally different. Um, aside from it being in a different country, you know, people think, oh, it's just over the border. But all the, like everything is different. The rules don't, don't apply. Like the same rights we have here as, um, U.S. citizens, they don't apply. It's sometimes even really difficult to get your kid back because, uh, as we talked about the accusation of the, of the abuse of the girl, the police showed up and the, on, the person on staff is like, no, we, she's in our custody, so therefore you can't even come in. We're like the, um, surrogate parents. You, know, right. you sign your you sign your kid away totally. They're a little bit different than than if you're staying in the states. You have to give everything up. So it's just good to know that you know for whatever reason, and I just I still don't quite get it. But for whatever reason, if a parent is going to send a kid to any place, like just like, be totally aware that if you send your child to um, a foreign country. You may not know what rules they're, they have to live under, and you may not be able to, you know, perhaps ever see your kid again. Right. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, <coughs> so excuse me. I have a. I'm dealing with a little cold here, so. Ah. Oh. I can do it. <laughs> I can. I can do it. It's cool. Uh. So yeah, that's that's the update. I wanted to make sure that uh, we were, had all the most current information, you know, because that's kind of the idea. Of what we're doing here is sure. focusing on uh, places that are open and operating and getting all the information we can about them and putting that, it out there so people that either have their kids there now or are thinking about it can make different choices. and. Right, not send their kid away to these places. Um, okay, so I think we should start with the question that we asked. And we asked, were you supposed to be utterly passive and still until you received permission to do anything? And how oppressive and extreme was your passivity expected to be? Yeah, good. I'm glad you have the questions because I don't have those in front of me. I have the answers. Yeah. So maybe you want to um, to do it like that where yeah, um, you ask me the questions and I'll answer it kind of like. So you're asking about sure. permission. You're asking about permission yeah. to uh, to make a move to do anything. So the answer is, uh, from my experience at SBA, I remember we had to ask permission for lots of things. Students were not allowed to have pens themselves, so staff would have to provide them with their permission, I guess, to write stuff down. Um, when the student first came to Sunset Bay Academy, they weren't allowed to have full pens. They actually wrote with the blue ink cartridge from clear big pens. So they had, it sounds like they're taking the ink cartridge out. I, I just want to say that we've also gotten another email from this person as we're recording. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that just more adding further information? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. that's really interesting about the pens. Like, do you understand yeah. what that means? Like, do they take the ink cartridge out of the pen and write no. the ink cartridge? That's, that's odd. Um, so, it's, and it goes on, if there was school staff that automatically hand out pens, they would count pens after use to make sure they had all of them as a missing pen might start a room search. I guess pens so, could be used as a weapon. And and also, you know, like <clears throat> tattoos or, or, you know, other things could go on. Uh, I don't know. Well, here's the, you're right, exactly. But here's the thing with that. Now, a pen is a, is a pen. It's just to write stuff. Like, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but if you put that into someone's head... 
Yep. That pens are dangerous, or pens can be used for bad things, or or could be used as a weapon. Then um, you can, or the school, it looks like it's kind of characterizing this pen. And making it taboo. As a, as yeah. a dangerous yeah. thing. So therefore, yeah. Yeah. we have to restrict it from you, because now we put that thought in your head. It's it's a very subtle way of um, of brainwashing, where anything that anything the kid looks at, the, yeah. the school says, "Oh no, that's that's dangerous. You can't you can't deal with that." When when I'm sure that none of these kids had issues with pens ever, like in their whole life. Yeah, like that wasn't yeah. the reason they were sent there because they this kid has been, you know, messing around with pens. Bobby's penning again. We got to send him down to Mexico to get him all penned out. Right. It's a good excuse. Pens are everywhere. They're, they're used for all. You know, they're everywhere. So yeah, it's it's just a great excuse to be able to further control kids with something that they that they need. You know. Yeah. And, and it's like seemingly inconsequential. You know, writing right. a pencil. Uh, that's the level of control that we're dealing with, and it's very subtle. That's, there's a lot of nuance to this. Um, it's not therapy. Like immediately, we get into this thing where I mean, I'm okay, also go ahead. I'm also thinking that like a pen could be used to write down information or things that are going oh, on. Yeah. Right, but they can't say that. So they can't no. say that part. Even though, even though that's probably the real fear, yeah, that the, that the school is is addressing, but they have to make it so it seems like it's something that's dangerous to the kids, not to the school, right? Because that, that's freedom, like being able to write and being able to tell your story. It's it's really interesting that this is the first thing because it's really what it's all about. Like it's yeah, like the inability to communicate, like, right? <laughs> and it's taking um, that first that first right because you're probably not going to want to talk anyway to people you don't know or share with people you don't know. But you're clearly witnessing abuse off the bat, and you can't even write it down, and you can't even that's like, abuse. Even you that, can't even that. It's, yeah, no, it's ahead. horrendous abuse, and it's torture. Because it's not allowing you to communicate with the outside world either, unless it's under their 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 control. It's not allowed to. Com it's not allowing you to, to communicate with yourself. Yeah. You know, like yeah. If, so, if you go to in like any normal therapy situation, it's often suggested in many different settings that hey, it, maybe it's a good, maybe it would be a good idea for you to uh, start a journal, write down your thoughts. You right, know, right. Uh, track the activities you you do during the day. You know, kind yeah. of get a good idea about you know what you're about and and what you do, and so you can actually physically look at it. So yeah. by taking that away, automatically, like immediately, you're you're looking at a non therapeutic environment. I mean, even yeah, even people in in mental health psych wards. Have access to pencils and writing utensils. Like yeah, prisons. Sure, like you know, what I'm, you know what I mean. Like, yep, yep. That's that's way out of bounds. And I don't know if this is a particular Mexican thing. I don't know. Um, I, my guess would be no, but I'd, I'd like to pursue the just that pen thing a little further to find out if other schools do similar things regarding um, writing stuff down. Yeah. All right, so, okay, so it goes on about regarding permission. Students were considered on run watch and suicide watch for, for the first two weeks at SBA. That's a long time to be on, and it's, it's that's a blanket policy. I know that <clears throat> oftentimes if people in other settings, again, express suicidal ideation, they will be put... And I'm not, I'm not talking about PTI, but other situations like adult drug therapy. If someone comes in and they are real shaky and they are 
have spoken about suicide or attempted it or things like that. Yeah. We put on, we put on suicide watch for a week to make sure that they're yeah. cool. So, but this is everybody for two weeks. Um, run watch, suicide watch. It, it's another good indication that, um, that what they're doing there isn't helpful because if it was, you wouldn't have to, you, you just wouldn't have to do that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. After two weeks, students were allowed to write with full pens. Okay. <laughs> also, during two weeks, a light in the room is turned on to keep watch on your students, usually the bathroom light. Other permissions included talking in rooms for something important. Talking is not allowed in the room, neither was nonverbal communication. So even if you're in your own room with your peers, no communication. Asking a period question, looking up things from the assignment in school, asking for grievance forms, complaint forms read by higher staff authority, permission to fill water bottles, permission for toilet paper, staff rationed, asking permission to talk for anything slash question, staff were present with students all day, so asking to go to a destination was not required as an SBA day was based on the schedule. So this is like, this is full on like, um, complete and total control. Yeah. Regardless of what the kid's in there for, their, their individual circumstances, none of that matters. It's all about, listen, we're gonna, you can't, you need permission to to get permission. Yeah. And 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 you can't ask for permission because that would involve talking. So why don't you just shut up and sit down and and not make eye contact with anybody? <laughs> like just stare in yeah. space blankly. Yeah. I like the. So uh. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Wow. So the, right. So the next question is, is let's say you wanted to get up and stretch and walk around aimlessly to get rid of tension. Could you get permission for that and do it as long as you wanted? Would you be restrained if you moved defiantly after being told not to? All right. So his answer regarding tension is, to my knowledge, nobody who was feeling tension walked around. However... There was once a time where a student who was feeling mad let out his anger to punching equipment with Mr. Edgar, who was the fitness coach at the time. If somebody showed signs of anger or tension, it was very highly possible that a person was given a, quote, unsatisfactory attitude, unquote, choice to consequence. It was a points-based system and unsatisfactory behavior was divided into choices one through seven. I remember choice two being a demerit of 25 points, about a day's worth of points. Getting up and walking without permission in an unassigned area of the facility was a big no-no and could be interpreted as an attempt to run away and could end up in being restrained if a student walked too far. So it sounds like it sounds like uh <clears throat> there I mean unless you uh were in good with the with the fitness coach and you, you were uh, allowed to punch a punching bag um there was really no relief from any stress that you were under because you really couldn't do anything if you I mean if you walk too far away from staff or or walking aimlessly that would be I mean, you're going to get restrained, I guess, is what you're yeah. doing. Like, that's you're right. You, um, um, so it, they're operating under a lot of fear. I mean, the facility itself, it sounds like that. But unless they it, it, exercise it total control over these kids, they're sure, and probably yeah. rightly so, they're certain that these kids will attempt to uh, walk away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel like this is just so intense. It's just like, 
kids stuck in a room with staff watching every move and, like, punishing them for every move, you know, and just, like, you just lose your mind in this. I can feel it already. Anyway. Um, right. Well, let, let's continue a little bit with that. I mean, we're talking about... Um, you know, if, if if you walk too far or if you have an unsatisfactory attitude, that's, you basically lose an entire day of... of so-called progress from the from the school's perspective. So kids are constantly being set back uh, points-wise. Yeah. Um, they can't phase up, level up into uh, different categories of freedom. And even if they do, it, all it takes is, you know, a, a, a grumpy look to uh, be knocked back down. So, uh, yeah. So aside from, <clears throat> uh, what's the word here? So not only is is are they not letting kids kind of relieve tension by, you know, moving freely, you know, in their environment, but they ratchet up the tension by making sure that kids don't. Yeah. Okay. So this next part is kind of, I'm not sure where to stop with the question, but just let me know. All right. Um, if another student knew of a plan to run or saw a kid run, they were encouraged to speak up and sometimes chase other students down to prevent them from running. Were they rewarded for this behavior? Can you name some of the rewards they could receive? Did re rewards include possibly progressing in program levels faster? Searches. No, let's, yeah. start, let's start, there, start there. Yeah. Okay. With, like, threats and incentives about yeah. running. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he says, um, run plans were a big thing at SBA and were not taken lightly. If students knew of any escape plan, They'd probably have the guts to tell staff, as everyone knows, it was attempts to run away. There was a good chance the whole, quote, family could be put on probation, a strict schedule void of all privileges, including uh, PE. So <clears throat> so that's, that's a good way to control everybody by yeah. saying that, I mean, it's kind of like, have you seen Full Metal Jacket? Yeah. Okay, right, like private pile on the jelly donut. Yeah. Right? He he gets to eat the jelly donut, you know. He gets mm -hmm. and everyone else is punished for it. Yeah. You know, if the kid runs away and they know that if, if a kid runs away that everybody else is gonna be put on restriction. Yeah. So of course they're gonna like police each other. Like it it makes it so much easier for the facility if they if they can ingrain this kind of self-policing behavior yeah. into the kids for fear of, of putting um, being put on probation. Mm -hmm. um, condiments and juice was also a privilege, and it was uh, what? Seriously? It's incredible. I'm, I'm sorry. Just like it's amazing that I that I'm even reading this. Like I know, condiments and juice is a privilege, and it was earned at level two, which was taken away during probation. <laughs> Under this schedule, all outside time is fitness time, one hour. Students are subject to more time. Any time in facility rooms might be met with motivational audio tapes, books, or audio book classics. If I remember correctly, the no talking rule severity was increased from choice four to five, choice five being 500 points and choice four being 100 points. During a probation experience, we were subjected to an illegal fitness session by program rules with Mr. Edgar, which started because everyone was subject to, quote, writing lines of the, quote, choice chart, 
a chart listing of all disciplinary behaviors, the level of severity, e.g., choice one, two, et cetera, as well as a brief description of those behaviors according to the appropriate categories. Um, so I guess this is another kind of thread situation where yeah. um, you're going to have to like memor like memorize and write down all of the punishments that you might face. Like um and yeah. kind of um kind of further brainwashing like like so the kids explicitly know <clears throat> the rules and are actually punished by the rules by having to write them out and it, that obviously would create a uh, an element of fear. Yeah. These are kids. Like, that's the other thing, you know, like, like, no, nowhere else in the world are, are children uh, treated like this. So, like, there's not, there's not any other place, even juvenile hall, you know, uh, I can't, I can't even think of, uh, a situation where, Kids are put under this kind of duress because, yeah. uh, just because. And like, and we have to remember that that this these people are here for a variety of different reasons too, with different, all kinds of different circumstances. You know, yeah, it's, um, it, it's terrifying. It, it's and that feeling you have. Every day, it's just so sickening. It's so sickening. <clears throat> I can understand you have some people are reluctant to um, really talk about this. It's, it's horrifying. Yeah. I can imagine it being very uh, traumatic just to even recount this stuff. It's amazing that this person was able to write so clearly about what exactly went on. And that's another thing I want to bring up is that... <clears throat> You know, oftentimes, like testimonials like this are discounted. Like, oh no, they just had a, they were a bad kid. Uh, of course, they're going to suffer consequences. But this really isn't like a negative review. It's just super factual about yep. about the procedures that went on. There's, I'm not reading a lot of judgment in this. You know, like no, um, it's just here's what happened. Here's what we had to go through, and I suppose we should uh, continue. Because there's there's a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so he goes oh, on. Yeah. Mr. Edgar, Mr. Edgar knew we were on probation, and when he checked up, found we were doing lines, the writing. So as a test to see if we learned anything from writing those, decided on a quiz. What was the severity for the action stated on the choice chart? For example, uh, item 401, talking in rooms. He decided to test the new kid. <clears throat> Naturally, even though the kid had been writing the choice chart for hours, he got many of them wrong, and all were subjected to many push-ups, 20 for each wrong. During all this, no one, even a staff who was previ previously an SBA student, Dared not to object to Mr. Edgar's fitness. Edgar was known by all to be a tough, serious, quote, no nonsense, unquote, type of person who at times could be very joking and normal at times, trying to help motivate peers at a sincere level, <clears throat> but piss him off in some way and he'd risk getting into, quote, thunder and lightning. I once corrected him when he said good morning, and it was actually afternoon. He didn't like that, so he made me do some push-ups. Anyway, we'd be doing push-ups forever if it wasn't for a peer who was low-level, who frequently broke a lot of rules, many minor rules. He made a bet that if he named the whole choice chart free of error, everyone would not have to do push-ups, which he successfully did. During probation, group therapy was at the mercy of the family therapy. So let's 
I don't know if there's a further question that relates more to to that. Uh, um, no. Uh, okay. No. So you were talking about group therapy, which is right. interesting because they indicate in their literature that they don't do group therapy. No. Like they say in their own brochure and on the Internet in their own uh, words that they don't uh, do group therapy, but obviously they do. Yeah. So it's another thing to watch out for is these places they, they say everything, you know, that sounds, I guess, reasonable. But once the kids are there, all all that all that uh, stuff is kind of out the window and they just do whatever they want with, you know, some people like fitness coach Mr. Edgar doing horrible things. Unqualified, by the way, I'm certain that uh, this guy is not a uh, therapist or counselor in any sense. Like, I'm just guessing, but uh, you know what? I'm probably guessing right. Cause yeah. He probably doesn't even have a, a background in uh, or a license to be a, a PE teacher. No, but again, this is Mexico, and maybe the rules are different there. You know, um, we don't know. It's Mexico. No. We can't find out. Like it's unless you are really versed in reading Spanish. And I, my guess would be that these kids from the U.S. and their parents aren't. They're just yeah. going to have to take the word uh, from the English language version that doesn't really apply in a different country. So you you do not you literally don't know like what's going to happen. So we go on with group therapy stuff. Okay. During probation, group therapy was at the mercy of the family therapist. If the therapist didn't want to come, he didn't have to. In my experience, we always had therapy during those times. The, pro the program was based on levels and in certain privileges depending on how high up the level was. Students were divided by lower levels and upper levels. Once upper level, you served as staff, assistant, or junior staff, and had privileges such as the ability to have food in your rooms, walking around the facility without permission, and many other privileges. Basically, a lot of normal people privileges. In the merit system, you got points by being good and had a merit sheet in which you graded yourself one for bad, two for good. Uh, things you are graded for, including things like positive attitude, making your bed, following rules, etc., which at the end of the day, by itself, totals to 24 points if graded with all twos. If staff felt you put in extra effort, you could be graded with three for perfection. Hmm. What really mattered was the staff's grading. If the staff grading your merits disagreed with you on a category, you got a negative three. Reasons to get extra points finishing an online class, which got you major points. Staff giving you permission for a three in a specific category on your merits. Holidays were highly anticipated at SBA. <clears throat> were chill, chill back days, kickback days at SBA, in which everyone who was at level three, new, neutral stride. It's a lot of lingo. Mm. And <clears throat> and up was allowed to participate in festivities, which included movies and other fun activities. Normal activities. These are like just normal things. These aren't really festivities. But. Right. We'll call them festivities because in this environment, movies and food in your room and board games and things like that must have been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. All levels below were made to sit and face a corner reading a book. Mm -hmm. Starting of level three was 500 points. So you had to accumulate up to f at least 500 points, which I guess at 24 points a day, that would be approximately a month um, or so. Yeah. That would be good for that long in order to be able to watch a movie. <clears throat> good, mean, good being a, a very subjective word. 
I remember those days. I remember those days very well, actually. Uh, everyone also got candy boxes most of the time, either by their parents or by SBA. They were often shoebox size filled with candy and sweets. And while students could eat as much candy as they wanted that day, students were not exempt from rules and still needed to eat at least 80% of their food with no exceptions. Students could also wear PE uniforms, shorts, sweatshirts, sweatpants. The day after holidays was always subject to room searches. Almost everything was thrown out, thrown about in a messy fashion, including the mattresses and everything was checked. People could get consequences and lose points for unfolded clothes, messy, th messy things, illegal items, and quotes, etc. It was quite common for students to get loaded with consequences during room searches. Hmm. So, there, <clears throat> it's another uh, tactic that's being used here, and it's that it's so we're we're going to uh like subjugate you and make you earn every normal thing that it, that any other person would find to be absolutely normal or yeah you know, like every day and then immediately like like snatch it away for any any reason so it's just um very it's kind weird, of a tease. Um, it's a, it's it's a, a tease, give and yeah. Take. Yeah. It's fucked. It's really fucked. Definitely. All right. So it looks like that's the end of, of that portion. The next thing I have is regarding searches. Is there a, yeah. is there a question about so, that? Uh, there is. Searches. Shoelaces removed. <laughs> Searched several times a day. What are these searches like? How invasive? Was there a time limit to how long this punishment could continue? What's the longest you know of it going on for? Night searches, were students woken up every half hour at night to be searched by several staff members? Were those night searches conducted? Bedroom, bathroom. I mean, where were those night searches conducted? Bedroom right. or bathroom? How invasive are those searches? Was there a time limit to how long this punishment could continue? What's the longest you know of it going on for? Was the victim allowed fewer hours of sleep than usual aside from being woken up every half hour during this punishment? Were right. you... Oh, yeah, let's we'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. um, let's say that. Because these are kind of general questions and... Yeah. And he answered pretty specifically, so I think we can go now. Um, yeah. <clears throat> he writes, uh, from time to time, there were occasionally searches or other searches done on students. Searches that involved the room were always messy like a tornado, and no stone was left unturned. From people's clothes to their mattresses to shoes, it's safe to say that nothing was left untouched. This could happen randomly or or expectedly, and always happened after holidays. There were also sometimes strip searches done on students where everyone would be in their underwear, but that was reserved for rare cases, severe cases, or scaring new students. One staff was making a big deal over a missing pen, and so started looking for the pen everywhere, even in SBA's gutter with a flashlight, wherein that failed, strip searches were initiated with Mr. Edgar. Each individual was checked one by one in a line, also squatted and coughed for extra, extra measures. The result, no pen was found. Mr. Edgar also did occasional fitness checks, which included stripping down underwear and measuring muscles for the tape measure, as well as weighing the student. And also, he did a fake cavity search on the student to scare the new student. Room searches happen during regular activities, that is, lower level students never witness searches in progress and sometimes upper level associated in these searches. It's common for staff to find consequences worthy material during these searches. Every fault 
worthy thing. It's noted down and students can lose many points during this time and even lose their levels provided they don't have extra points to cushion back on. After they are given all their consequences to fill out on a form, form which they are to state what the rule violation they did and what they will do in the future to prevent the rule violation. In some cases, students received consequences they didn't deserve because they didn't break rules, but staff thought they broke a rule, or also because the staff thought they saw a person actually break a rule that that person didn't actually do. Sometimes they were specific staff that power trip, but this was rare. There was also night staff who walked around back and forth at night to monitor us and make sure we weren't talking in the rooms. They'd have flashlights with them and shine the lights in our faces if they suspected anything suspicious. They also gave us toilet paper. So it just kind of continues the um, random, never know what to expect. Um, yeah. Kind of personal violations. Um, it that sounds really, really awful. Like the right. idea that <clears throat> that you're gonna you're going to like in the case of like the fake cavity search to scare the new kid. Are you kidding me? Yeah, <sighs> fucking god awful. And and again, the, the pen comes up like this thing yep. with pens, like. Any excuse, like this, you know, the smallest thing could trigger, you know, uh, like an FBI style raid on, on these yeah. kids' rooms where everything was just yeah. tossed and turned up and messed up and, and it wouldn't, I mean, he didn't really indicate this, but it sounds like there was a bit of, um, Deception going on too, where you know unseen room searches could suddenly uh, they suddenly find some bad thing like a pen, and and then therefore you know you now you're going to suffer consequences because because they just wanted you to suffer consequences like yeah you know you didn't take the pen but. It it was quote unquote found there, so um, you know maybe everyone do push ups. Everybody yeah. is going to do push ups in, in their underwear. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, therapy. So now, <laughs> right. Therapy. Uh, this is this is going on right now. By the way, you know. Yeah. This is, this is this uh, happened last night. Yeah, it happened last night. It's happening right now as we as we speak. Um, all right. So now we have how were physical restraints con how were physical restraints conducted? Could you be restrained for any other reason than attempting to escape, attacking someone, or trying to hurt yourself? What would could they do to you if you passively refuse to do anything? Okay. So he's talking about runaway situations and restraints. I'll, I'm going to make it. Don't worry. I'm just a little sniffly. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right. Aww. Runaway situations. In the case that a person attempts to run away, they are restrained. And lower levels aren't allowed to witness them. So these new kids aren't allowed to see the restraint being done, I guess. Right. Uh, staff is with you 24-7. That's always. Mm. Students would have to be extremely careful if they ever developed an escape plan. I was at the program with two lower-level students and one upper-level planned on an escape that was successful. This was accomplished because... Uh, the three speaking Spanish to avoid suspicion of an escape plan. The funny thing is, after they were somehow able to cross the border, they were <coughs> later, later told that SBA doesn't want them, maybe because they considered a risk on their students. They didn't want them back. 
Mm. I don't know if this is specifically a unique case or what what that the students were unwanted after a successful getaway. Many students blaming me, saying it was all my fault because I could have earlier talked to the upper level involved had I only chose to talk to him. Right. My parents found out earlier about this guy during a phone call and forbid me to talk to him under any circumstances, even though we were roommates, saying he was a bad influence. So I ended up unwillingly giving him the silent treatment until, until he ran away. Right. I always viewed my I always viewed my parents as scary, and they were hard to deal with, even as higher program staff were afraid of them. <clears throat> well, let me pause here for a second. So, you don't often hear, at least I haven't heard yet, much about scary parents. That Because <clears throat> usually it seems to work the other way where, where the parents are intimidated by the school or by the, you know, by the program. Yeah. But we, we need to remember how much money the programs are getting from the parents. And, and because of that, how much control or perceived control or, or fear that, that the schools might have of Certain parents who are vocal, who demand more of a uh, input or into kind of what's going on, they might be like they might be you know down with whatever's going on there, punishment wise or whatever. Um, but that's that's interesting that um, that parents can exert some pressure over the program and it would be nice if if parents were scary in the sense that they were to demand better treatment of their kids if i mean if they're going to put their kid in there anyway they might as well demand that uh, their kids are treated with uh, with respect and and, and given actual therapy rather than they're being uh, forced into scary situations constantly so and that, that was kind of, earn, kind of like, interesting. Like forced to earn juice and forced to earn, you know, condiments. Like this is bullshit. I mean, for real. Right. Yeah. I mean, for the price you're right. paying, you should be, your kids should be getting like stellar treatment from the top doctors in the fucking world. You know, I'm sorry. That's just my thought. <laughs> it just makes you wonder like if, if these like higher program staff will like, will like yell that by this kid's parents. Yeah. Like, and, and, and stuff like that, like, you know, I'm going to get you fired kind of situation. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I yeah. wonder. Um, so, uh, and other, I guess, to finish this, on other parents who are, who have been convinced that they're doing the right thing should understand that there are, there are people who, who know better, there are parents who know better, who know what kind of pressure these kids are being put under, and who are, who are with the program, and who are further facilitating your kid being hurt. Mm-hmm. You might be a parent who doesn't know any better, but you should know that there are other parents who are bound and determined to make sure that your kid is treated more poorly than their kid. Yeah. That's real. Yep. All right. It's, it's just like uh, circles within circles. Here. Um, okay, so restraining a person involved, usually the fitness coach, here's Mr. Edgar again, and consisted of MMA coaches. So... So they're, they're putting kids in, like, leg and arm bars. And, like, yeah, chokes and, and shit, most likely, that, yeah. <laughs> right, those sirens seem appropriate right now. Yeah, like, sorry. Get that kid out of there. Yeah, right. All right, so all of the fitness coaches of SBA, to my knowledge, have some sort of experience with MMA fighting, 
or similar knowledge or training. Mr. Edgar, for example, fights professionally even to this day, though he no longer works for SBA. I wonder why. <clears throat> Staff communication over long distance can the walkie talkies and higher program staff almost always in Spanish. In the event that someone is on suicide watch, razors are taken away and there was a possibility that one could be sent to the intervention room depending on the severity of the situation. Intervention was standing in an empty room facing a wall all day with occasional possible hourly sitting breaks. Food was less and void of condiments. In earlier days of intervention, a person at, sat in a chair and did fitness on the hour every hour in that room. The person earned points by doing puzzles such as word searches, mazes, and sudoku. The person was also graded using a much shorter merit list than could be penalized for rule breaking. Going through intervention meant an automatic loss of all points, meaning you were left with zero points, and any rule breaking and intervention would put you at a negative point level. Also during earlier days, intervention music was played consisting of Christmas religious music and random inspiration music that was meant to inspire us. This music was played over and over and over again. You could be restrained for being violent, attacking <coughs> someone, attempting to run away, or some other serious reason. So, it sounds like, <coughs> it sounds like at least at SBA that that we per se were used, um, I guess, you know, for, uh, I don't know, other serious reason, like if you're going to think they're being violent or attacking someone, uh, but the the more awful thing, it sounds like the intervention room where, where kids are standing yeah. facing the wall like, you know, like they're in the Blair Witch. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, I guess enough enough said about that. That's, that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's not therapy. What's the term? No. Okay. Okay. So, um, next. What would or could they do to you if you passively refuse to do anything? Did they force feed or threaten force feeding to anyone? All right. Please Let's list with the, yeah. Hold on. Because there's a refusal answer, and it's pretty clear. Yeah. And then, then okay. it gets into the force reading. Refusal. Okay. This is like a sound bite right here. You are mm. not allowed to refuse to do anything. You did not have a choice. If you did, it was intervention for you. In Mexico, it is said, you don't have any rights. So, you said the kids time and time again. This is Mexico. You have no rights. Or, this is Mexico. There are no rules. And that's kind of yep. what we're talking about in the beginning, that that these un ignorant parents who are sending their kids to the love, lovely sounding Sunset Bay Academy or the California Leadership Academy has nothing to do with the United States. It's it's yep. not a it's not a U.S. company. They don't they don't play by U.S. rules as bad as they might be, and, and they're pretty bad on their own. But um, but these kids are right. This is this is Mexico. There are no rules. They can do they can do anything they want, and and no one no one's going to come to save you. You know, no one is going to uh, stop these people from doing this. Uh, <clears throat> Eric. Eric Thor asked me to see if I could find out about getting um, the U.S. consulate involved to, mm. uh, because it's a, because it's an international situation, really. It's not, this isn't a situation that's governed by, like, say, like, NATSAP or WASP, um, what a, you know, a governing body that's supposed to watch out for kids in these programs. That doesn't even apply. 
and because it's international and these and, and maybe the climate right now is yeah. good for this kind of thing because of all of the immigrant situations that are happening sure at the moment um if people if people are so up in arms about the South American refugees, they might very well be interested in uh, American kids who are being uh, imprisoned in Mexico too. Maybe we'll see. I mean, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna pursue it as as much as I can, make some inquiries, but uh, but there, it seems like there's there's something that could be looked into at this because there seem to be so many like ethical and legal violations going on that um you know i don't i don't know I, I i i hate to get like thinking that that you know what we're doing here is going to make any kind of difference really ultimately yeah but it's super encouraging when people like like chris here are saying Listen, I, I've never told anybody this stuff. I've never had a, a platform to express it. And, you know, and we're doing all that we can do by, by putting it out there. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're getting some results. Like, like I, I said agree. before, if there's, if there's one parent out there that's hearing this and they make a different choice and decide not to send their kid here or to some other program, like, we've accomplished something. There's also something else happening that I was made aware of today by survivors that, you know, there are a lot of people who have just gotten out of this program who are still stuck. And they're still sure. stuck thinking thinking the way the program thought. And right. this is helping helping shake other survivors to say something to them, too. You Absolutely. know, it's just, it, it's creating a dialogue again. And it's so vital to have this dialogue, you know. Yeah, it's definitely worthwhile. <clears throat> and um, even if we don't see, if we don't necessarily are in a position, position to observe, um, the results, um, we we know that uh, that we are getting. Re Things moving because of the of the reactions we're getting from uh, people that are hearing us, for sure. Yeah, I I need to yeah. pull back up my my email for some reason. It shut down. Sure. So we're, let's see, we're back. All right. All right. So, so the I next, think we're at the next question is about yeah. force feeding. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Where? Oh, yeah. Let me read it. Sorry. Yeah. My read fault. the force feeding <laughs> thing. Let me get to that. Uh, did they force feed or threaten force feeding or on anyone? Okay, so what he says is, <clears throat> uh, you are required to eat at least 80% of your food, whether you liked it or not, flat out refusing to eat, which I never witnessed during my time at SBA, line of view and intervention. I guess... <clears throat> You never saw it because uh, the kids knew that not eating the food would, you know, keep you standing in a empty room staring at a wall. So yeah, that was probably a known thing. Um, while not finishing at least eighty percent of the food resulted in a small consequence and demerit of points. Uh, food was never forced down anyone's throat. Kids who had special dietary needs needed some kind of note either from the doctor or from the parents and result in them getting a different diet depending on the situation. So, yeah. So although <clears throat> they weren't force feeding kids, they were definitely making sure that, uh, you know, this was, I, I, I would compare it to kind of a, a strict conservative household where, where you better clean your plate or no, you know, no movie, or, which, um, doesn't seem that bad, but when coupled with everything else and just the general idea of being under threat, it's it's bad. Like I don't think, and this is the way I was 
raised um, on a personal note. When I when I was given food as a kid, I didn't have to eat it if I didn't like it, but I couldn't make derogatory remarks about the food. I couldn't say yuck. I couldn't, like my right. mom wouldn't right. allow me to like talk negatively about the food I was yeah. being served. But I didn't have to eat it if I didn't like it. Yep. Um, and that worked, you know. Uh, but it's this whole thing. It's it's still under this umbrella of coercion and threat. So even these smaller, seemingly smaller issues, like you better eat eighty percent, because my understanding is that they would measure the amount of food, like on the plate. And determine whether or not it was, you know, enough. Like, right. The, oh no, that's only seventy percent of the food. You need this much food. Right. right. Okay. Um, and next is what? Therapy. Some questions about therapy. Uh, let me look. Um, next is please list all the potential punishments you can think of that oh. you saw or were subjected to. We don't have that. Okay. I mean, I think well, we, we already kind of covered that. Yeah, I think we did. So The next thing I have is regarding therapy. Yeah, I want to know about biogenetic, bioenergetic therapy. What biogenic, bioenergy, sorry. I want to know what bioenergetic therapy was like. Did you go oh. on outing? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, so yeah. we talked a little bit about bioenergetic therapy, and it's the idea that uh stuff like you know working out with Mr. Edgar is going to further develop you psychologically like or yeah. eating eighty percent of your food is going to give you better mental health it, that's it's it's a it's a line of therapy that's been fairly debunked as quackery in the mental health world um but there are still some people who who use this kind of thing um yeah like if only if only you got out and jogged every morning you you know you'd feel so much better about yourself and so the way that works is if you go out every morning and jog you may indeed feel like physically mentally better about yourself yeah but that doesn't solve your mental health problems it doesn't solve your psychological problems it just doesn't it, there's not a correlation there. It's two separate things. <clears throat> so they try to combine this stuff and say that, you know, your physical fitness is, is a direct correlation between that and your, your mental health. So that's what bioenergetic therapy is. The answer <clears throat> that he gave regarding this um, is that uh, group therapy consisted of the family therapist coming down to meet with the program, the program family. So I guess that's all the kids and staff. Yeah. Um, to discuss goals and other things. Sometimes, sometimes it would be an educational psychologist, excuse me, an educational psychological activity meant for us to learn something. Some activities required us to draw or meditate or sometimes practice a technique for relaxation. Sometimes the therapist checked up on the family to see if everyone is doing well. Just, and again, I think the family means like the students and staff, not their actual families. No, I think it means the group, the unit, you know, right, and right. because they're divided by <laughs> unit. So, yeah. But they're calling yeah. themselves a family. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Uh, there was a time when staff got together in the making of a, quote, new program system in 2012. During that period, when they first started with the new system, they got creative with their groups and actually came up with activities they enjoyed. They divided the psychologists into their own categories, such as psychodrama, and I think one was called creative arts. This all went well for a few months. Then the group became repetitive again, and everyone group is pretty much the same as all the other ones. Why even bother with the different names? I guess they burned out on all their creativity. Right. The worst group, in my opinion, is psychotherapy, run by Robert Murillo. 
his groups consisted of a lot of <clears throat> psychological doctrine stuff, ABCs, which were action, behavior, and consequence, and more psychological blah, 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 stuff like that. At least right. the other groups run by different people were more tolerable and less straining. Mr. Murillo gave us homework during his group, which was due by the next time we group we group met with him. Um, that that stuff right there. That's the um, that's the stuff I was talking about about um, this uh, action, behavior, and consequence. Yeah. Everything is everything is tied to what you do, not. Um, who you are, you know, um, right. as a right. person. Right. So it it sounds like they don't really have a good therapy program if they're trying all these different things and, and play acting and doing psychodrama work, which is a lot of like aversion therapy where, you know, well, you know, um, one kid plays the, the, the uh, concerned parent and the yeah. other kid, you know, plays the uh, misbehaving kid, and there's yelling and, and stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, that, uh, and then they pass it off as like, um, you know, creative arts when it's really just um, more, more brainwashing, more uh, yeah. efforts to control the kids and and just and how they flattery. think or behave. Yeah, and just general practice. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, if, it, a, if a school around for this long had a successful uh, real therapeutic program, they wouldn't be trying, you know, new things. They would just... Right. <clears throat> they, would have, they would have it locked down, and it would be like a method. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, a, a, in general, a, a therapist, they would go to see, like, a psychotherapist or counselor just out in the world. They generally have a, a field of practice, and they continue to, you know, stuff they learned and, and found was effective in, in their schooling and in their internship and practice. And they continue yeah. to do that same thing because they tend to find results. You know, they they have clients, and their clients get better, and then they're you know, like mm -hmm. they they move on and. And they get letters back from their former clients. Thanks, doctor, for you know showing me that uh, or medicating me in the right way or all that right. stuff. Um, so, uh, all right. And then we go on. What I have next is um, regarding outings or seeing seeing the outside world. Hmm. Let me see. Um, sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. Did you go on outings? What were the outings? How okay. many staff per student? You know, yeah. Did all you right. go on so, outings and what were the outings? It's the question. Uh, the answer is the more you advance in the program, the more you were treated like a normal person. When you got upper level, there were times when you could go to fun places like movies or restaurants. Uh, but his staff always took us in a van with all the upper-level kids. These were fun activities that normal people did and weren't boring, whether it be visiting places like the beach, places we'd never seen. Upper levels always looked forward to these types of events. I don't know if they still do equine therapy, uh, therapy with horses for lower levels still. Um, so you're getting rewarded. By, by being allowed to do activities that no, normal people do, it's again, yeah. it's not really a, it's not really a reward. It's just what normal people do. Um, right. But because of the situation they're in, it becomes this really great thing. I mean, of course, you want, people like going to the movies and going to the beach. Yeah. But it's not really a reward. It's just what normal people do. Um, but like and, when you're sitting. When you're sitting at the lower level and you don't get to go to the movies and then oh, they all come yeah. back and they've seen oh, the movie, awful. it is the worst feeling you've ever fucking felt in your life. Right, and so when this really happens for way. months on right. end, you create this thing where you become more and more willing to, to drink Kool-Aid and more and more willing to do what they say to get to that. 
that's that's the real purpose of it, isn't it? Like that it's is not the that we're treating yeah. the upper level kids to a fun thing. It's really more to show the lower level kids, hey, look, you don't know what these upper level kids get to do. Yeah, you know, they're leaving, and, and, yeah. and they'll be back in a few hours. You know, tonight, whatever, and and you're going to be staring at a wall or writing something, writing. Uh, all the levels of punishment that you might endure yeah. while they're gone. So it's really more, again, about that compliance thing. And also, it's good to remember that these upper-level kids, with any mistake they might make, can be knocked back down at any time, you know, at any given right. time, for any reason, you know, uh, on a whim. Yeah. Yeah, or, I mean, like, if, to, you, if you go to... to well, for nothing. It's even to just like, hey, let's knock that kid down. Yeah. To show these other kids that they're never safe. Right. I mean, like, if you right. go to the beach or you go to the movies and you attempt to grow a brain or have any type of, like, outside of the staff eyes thing going on, you're definitely not yeah. going to be going out for a while, you know? That's just well, part of it. Right. And those are kind of like, I guess, yeah. cool. Like real things, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. But my point was like, if I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of of the of the staff, hey, and I'm I might I might just knock that kid down for no reason. How did it go? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. All right. Then we get into staff staff to student ratios. Um. Regarding staff of students, there are about 15 students. Might be a little more or less. There were one or two staff per shift back in the day, possibly even three, if I remember correctly. Staff of the family were called chaperones. Nowadays, in more recent times, more like one chaperone per family. Then, of course, you have the other staff, which are the family therapists, Dr. Hugo, higher up, program staff, academic teachers, Christina Heredia, Committed at her ready, a fitness coach. Yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah. So. The next question <laughs> would be how many medicated, uh, how many were medicated and who was giving and who prescribed? All right. Um, so Chris answers, I'm not really too knowledgeable regarding this subject, but I do know some things. Regarding how many students were medicated, I do not know. At the times I saw students taking meds in front of higher program staff, I witnessed them taking pills out of those all too familiar with the daily pill dividers, after which staff would ask the students to open their mouth and check if they swallowed their meds by asking them to lift their tongues and check them thoroughly inside their mouth. While I was at SBA, there was a student that suspected they were giving placebo pills. This he told the family while in group. Who knows how many of them were given real or fake meds? I never took meds, but the thought of them happening to other kids is a really scary thought. There were also some kids who had asthma inhalers, which staff kept in the family binder along with all the pens and paper and stuff. I'm not sure who was ultimately responsible for handling all the pills and medical diagnosis stuff, but my guess is that parents have notes from their child's doctor telling them what they have an appropriate medication to take during my stay at SBA. There have been two doctors, Habib Khoury and Rene Betia. Habib Khoury I don't know much about, but from my experience when I saw him, he always smiled and was very friendly. I don't know much about his medical practices, but I heard one upper-level kid mention he walked in on Dr. Habib Khoury only to find him watching a YouTube video on how to remove an ingrown toenail. And this was the doctor that was supposed to remove the kid's ingrown toenail. Oh, God. Wow. Dr. Rene Vettia seems to be knowledgeable and qualified. The whole facility once had a lengthy presentation on sex. Ed, with Q&A, he does not work at a or but works as a doctor somewhere else, also occasionally posting his pics on social media. Of his graphic surgical procedure, some parts appropriately blurred out. So, wow. All right. 
iffy, iffy medical staff. Extremely. And this uh, Habib Khoury guy, he is now at another uh, Mexican facility called uh, Pacific Life. And, right. Uh, we're gonna. I think we're gonna get into them in a in a week, in a couple of weeks. See what they're all about. It's gonna be yeah. more of the same, you know. I mean, ultimately, it's gonna be more of the same. But the important part is to put the names out. Agreed. I mean, even if it's just like, oh, this place is just like the other place. It's important to know that you know this place is just like the other place. Yeah. All right, so then we get into uh, what were the seminars? seminars? Did you have to participate? And what's interesting about this is that this wasn't necessarily, I don't think it, this was a question about a different school. But, so I was, when I wrote, when I sent it, I was like, oh, do they even have seminars? Like, I didn't know. Um, it was, I just kind of sent this blindly. But the answer is that everyone had to participate. Uh, they did not have a choice. Uh, the old seminars back in the day were traumatic for many students. This lady called Miss Ruth was ruthless. She shamed a lot of kids and made them cry. She would smile occasionally and would smile sometimes at people's emotional stories saying, how did that make you feel? She took us through various seminar processes for emotional growth, for example, making us beat the floor with a rolled up towel at an imaginary picture of our lives, beating and destroying all bad photos which we didn't like, all the times we messed up in our lives. I think the types of seminars Miss Ruth did was a specific format because I remember in my previous program, I went through and graduated a seminar with some of the same exact seminar processes. For example, beating the photo album with the towel, with a seminar having the same exact rules as the other seminar I went through at the program. <clears throat> Nowadays, seminars are more modern and don't follow any specific format in which things are more tolerable and somewhat fun. We still go through psychological stuff in the seminar, but at least we can breathe, not like Miss Ruth, Ruth's public shaming seminar, where sometimes you choose out, get kicked out, and the rest support you in your decision to leave. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So, from from what it sounds like, just on, on a superficial level, is that, that um, well, these seminars are run by outside groups, right? They're come, like, come in as yeah. educational consultants. And it sounds like maybe over the years that they've kind of refined some of their techniques to make them seem fun or yeah. more engaging, less less scary. I don't know. But all to the same purpose. It's, it's uh, psychological training, psychological coercion, brainwashing. Yeah. Um, of course. Okay. So... We're nearing the end of this testimonial, and there's some additional information provided. Um, in 2012, SBA had a major change in how the program worked. They got rid of points, and students were graded on averages given entirely by different staff of the program. Grading is entirely at the mercy of staff, of their experience of you, you have no say in your grading, neither can staff show you your grade. Students are graded by different staff in different categories like fitness, psychotherapy, etc. Each level has a required average level. Students are graded on the scale of 5 to 10, with 5 being bad and 10 being excellent on things such as participation, leadership, etc. Student is allowed to miss one week of under average grade, getting under average Getting an under average grade means not getting privileges that are provided that students specifically. Where am I wrong? Oh. Okay, missing two weeks of under averages risks losing one's 
level, when the new program started, intervention was labeled timeout, and consequences were, uh, quote, referrals with severities. Intervention no longer seems to be practiced. The program levels are also changed and are based on Prochka's stages of change, whatever that is, with SBA adding two of their own levels, transitional and aftercare. Aftercare is done after graduation. So, uh, it sounds like they, uh, did some, uh, superficial changes, kind of like maybe what the seminars did, where they made it, yeah, like more friendly sounding or, yeah. or they refined their techniques a little bit, uh, probably, probably because they got a different clinical director or something. Yeah. Who, who wanted to make it, you know, remake the school in their own image based on their own kind of um, professional practices. Um, right. But the same stuff. It's the same stuff. It's not, they relabel things, but it's really the same things going on. And aftercare, which is an effort to gain more money from the parents after the kids have already graduated, probably in like a, in more of like an outpatient type type thing. Yeah. All right. So, so I'm going to read church. this because, yeah, right. this is about the church. Um, yeah. Church is also a thing. It started on the first anniversary of Miss Christina's dad's death. SBA also claims to be a Christian school, but the only thing making them religious is the pastor's hour-long class once a week and religious concert on special occasions. The pastor is young, and I don't think he gets paid by SBA, as he works for his own church. The church thing is contradictory, because on the SBA website, they say they allow teens to practice their religion and don't pray, press any specific religion on a teen. Well, their CLA website, they claim they are Christian. Ah, right, right. So this is that this is that merging of SBA and CLA, which right is this you know it's the same thing, but they're they're yep. being they're saying they're two different two different entities. Mm -hmm. Huh. All right. And then okay. the final part that came in earlier um, is also letters to parents from students at first were many pages as one wanted, then limited to two pages, and of course read by the family therapist who scanned letters to make sure no quote-unquote manipulation goes to, to home was written. There were these rumors that sometimes the family therapist or higher staff would edit students' letters before scanning and faxing them to parents. They, of course, denied all rumors of this and claimed to send the letters as is. SBA was subject to rumors every once in a while, some big and sometimes small, even ranging to the point of one of the young, handsome fitness instructors having sexual intercourse with a female upper level who later graduated. I mean, right. this is this is common in program stuff. I mean, I, I I noticed so many commonalities between my experience and this. It's very simple. Uh, well, this the whole idea of the letters being written and then they were looked at, and and you know to look for manipulation, and then yeah. the, same, the next sentence. SBA is saying, oh, no, no, we send, we send letters as is. Well, well, of course not. Like, you can't have it both no. ways. You can't, you can't scan a letter and look for, uh, things that you don't like and then send it off. I mean, that would kind of defeat the whole purpose. Well, so, also, you um, can't, you can't create an environment where you tell kids to write a letter about their experience and then at the same time say, well, if you write anything quote unquote negative, or manipulative, it's it's going to go against you in the program, so don't even bother to do that. I mean, I would imagine that most letters were edited anyway, just based on the well, student's fear, you know? 
Right, they're either edited or because it didn't say they come, it would come back to you. Um, no, it did. They didn't say though. The list editor was rejected. Yeah. So of course they edited them. <laughs> yeah. Like or yeah. rewrote them. Like or yeah. didn't send them at all. Or yeah. Like because you know the letter didn't come back. If a letter right. was rejected, it was probably either thrown away or or changed. Or uh, and, they, and the student would never know. Yeah, they would never know whether their letter got to their parent until the school decided to allow them to see a response right. to what you know to whatever letter that. That's super manipulative, and it's another thing that is kind of overlooked a little bit. We started. This is interesting. Like we're wrapping this up now, but. We started out with pens, right? And we're ending yeah. with pens. Yeah. And, and ultimately, it comes down to the controlling of communication um, <coughs> entirely. Like, you, you're going to have to, you know, write what we want you to write in the way we want you to write it. And, and we're not going to allow you to freely communicate with, with the outside world. You know, unless it's on our terms, and yeah. um, that that goes totally yeah. against any idea of, of therapy because ultimately, real therapy is completely and totally about about communication. Like, there's no other thing that it is other than communication. Yeah. It's not about push-ups. You know, it's not any, about any of that stuff. No. Nope. Wow. So uh, I want to. I want to say. Yeah, me too. Such a well written, uh, I guess really like an expose about what really goes on. Yeah. At, at Sunset Bay Academy. And it, it also, uh, as we find out, the California Leadership Academy. Um, I think, uh, I think this is going to touch a lot of people and maybe, maybe change some minds. Hopefully. I hope so. Yeah. All right. Well. All right. Onward and upward. Yeah. This is the yeah. uh, B2B podcast, Survivor Series, with an, another devastating blow to the troubled teen industry.